One of the unique aspects of my role in the art school is being able to leverage that business background of saying like, we have to produce a product, we have to market a product, and we have to make sure that it makes sense for students and for families to understand what is the return on investment if you're going to consume this product, um, but also being able to develop programming and develop curriculum that is data-driven mm -hmm. in order to support the needs of this next generation and how they're consuming education, how they're consuming art and design. Hey, welcome to the Higher Ed Storytelling University podcast, a podcast dedicated to helping higher ed marketers tell better stories, create better content, and enroll more students. My name is John Azoni. I'm the founder at Unveiled. We're a video production company working specifically with college Marcom teams to help you automate your student success stories uh, through a subscription approach. You can learn more at unveiled.tv. That's U-N-V-E-I-L-D. Uh, or if you want to chat directly with me, you can find me on LinkedIn. Email me at john at unveiled.tv. That's J-O-H-N. Or uh, new uh, to the process here is go to unveiled.tv and you can actually uh, text me. Wait 10 seconds. A little box will pop up that says text John. Uh, that goes right to my personal phone. So uh, if you have any questions about our subscriptions, you want to chat, you want to say hi, you want to talk about current events, um, I will probably have not much to add about current events, uh, but we can talk about them anyways. My guest today is Sabrina DePest. Uh, Sabrina is the marketing director at the Maryland Institute College of Art, where I actually attended for a brief stint, uh, you know, in the early 2000s, uh, which is what uh, piqued my interest in having her on the show. Uh, she has also worked as a consultant for small businesses, delivering refined verbal identity and digital audits across all platforms and channels. Sabrina is also the founder of the marketing agency Buffer and Muse and uh, host to the podcast Musings on Marketing. So in this episode, we are going to take you behind the scenes of a uh, of marketing a rigorous art school and also behind the scenes of starting a podcast. Uh, Sabrina's podcast is relatively new, as is this podcast. Uh, so we, we discuss learnings, you know, along the way of starting a podcast tools that, uh, Sabrina uses to create her podcasts and, uh, much more. Uh, so if starting a podcast for your school is something that you're interested in, uh, you'll get something out of hearing how others have started. Uh, so stay tuned. Also, uh, side note, was having some issue with my microphone um, and the sound quality is terrible. And so I just, um, I apologize. We'll get through this together. All right. So here's my conversation with Sabrina DePest. I guess I'll start off by uh, sharing. Yeah, I'm the director of marketing for MICA, Maryland Institute College of Art based in Baltimore. Um, one of the oldest uh, art and design colleges, continuously running art and design colleges in, um, in the country. I've been at MICA for a little over four and a half years, um, where I started predominantly working within one of the academic areas uh, called Open Studies. A lot of the universities and colleges call that area continuing education or continuing studies. And I was the, uh, a couple of different title changes, but essentially I was the director of marketing and recruitment um, at Open Studies and then uh, director of brand marketing. Uh, at Open Studies, where I helped to create a brand platform for that um, for that academic unit, and really position that academic unit as um, integral to the college and integral to uh, providing access to resources and education and facility um, to the community. And uh, super uh, great experience working within that office. And then I, I recently, about six months ago, transitioned to working as the director of marketing for the institution where I'm now housed within the Office of Strategic Communications, which is the central comms department of, of the college. And my role there is, is really to produce and develop uh, marketing strategies to help promote the, the programs um, to recruit for the different offerings that we have. And one of the... Um, one of the cool things about my role is that we are obviously an art and design school and um, we're always thinking about new programming and new offerings to provide to people that um, want to do art and design and, that, and obviously looking at trends and uh, return on investment and career opportunities and jobs that are yet to exist. We're, we're developing programs that um, can help support the future of art and design and education. So it's exciting to work um, 
here at MICA uh, during this time, um, developing new programming and there's some uh, some cool offerings that we plan to launch um, within the next fiscal year, which is exciting to, to see and, and to be a part of. Did you grow up in uh, Baltimore or? Yeah, I, I grew up in Baltimore County, um, suburbs of Baltimore County and uh, went to high school here. And after high school, I actually uh, moved to South Florida uh, where I went to college. Um, I graduated from Florida International University with a Bachelor of Business Administration and a concentration in marketing. Uh, I lived in, in Miami for a total of 10 years, and that's really where I I learned my chops in the early stages of, of marketing. And, and I my first job was working for the Miami Heat organization um, in sales and group sales, and that was just an extraordinary experience. And I will always root for, for that organization, as uh, you may or may not know, the Heat are entering their finals they're going to the finals this year which is exciting to see as the underdog team they're ranked number eight <laughs> and <laughs> that they're um they're contending to uh, contending for the the title so so yeah i um grew up in the area moved to miami um lived there for 10 years and um <clears throat> had an, uh, an incredible experience at the heat organization where so i really learned about customer experience um really providing a, a great experience for people to consume a product that was exciting, obviously. Um, and my role there is uh, developing a sales team, coordinating all the different uh, uh, event logistics for groups to come into the arena um, and have a great experience outside of just the basketball game. Um, a lot of the programs that um, my team ran and produced were around fundraising opportunities for nonprofits and community organizations um, in the South Florida area. <clears throat> and after Miami, I took a leap of faith. This is around the time where there was a lot of conversations and blogs around follow your passion, do what you love, entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And so I took a leap of faith, quit that really exciting, comfortable job to pursue working in wellness and fitness, which was another passion of mine. Um, ended up traveling the world, uh, interviewing a bunch of different uh, CrossFit business owners and gym gym owners and personal trainers and so forth and decided to um, move to New York where I pursued personal training and working with women entrepreneurs in particular um, to uh, to train them and also just understand how they were running their businesses and um, ended up working in fitness for a few years, came back to Baltimore, uh, managed a, a women's only gym here, worked with uh, retail athletic brand Lemon um, building the brand one of their sister sister apparel companies in Baltimore. Um, so doing lots of community marketing, lots of event marketing, social media marketing to help establish a new brand in the area. And then um, after working in retail and you know uh, wellness, I ended up working with a brand experience agency where I was able to really work with a, a variety of a ton of other industries and in tech, government, um, pharmaceuticals, uh, just helping to develop brand strategy and marketing strategies for uh, those types of industries and brand identities and all that stuff. So I, I've dabbled in, in lots of various aspects of marketing, starting in sales and customer experience and really just building up from there. That's great. That's great. I was actually just down in Miami um, this past weekend. Nice. <laughs> um, I visited my my buddies. My buddies turning forty um, in a couple of weeks, so we, me and my other friend went out down to visit him. We went deep sea fishing and caught a shark. <laughs> it was very unexpected. That's awesome. It was like no bites for like two hours, and we we're like, all right. Boys, let's pack it in, and then all of a sudden, a shark. <laughs> <laughs> but we Never visited. Uh, we went down to South Beach in, in Miami, and that was, that was the first time I'd been down there, and that was um, uh, very different. <laughs> yeah, I would say Miami is just—it's a—it's a world in and of itself. Like it is completely different than any other place that I've ever been to, and. It's a, it's a fun time. Um, yeah, so. it was everything I imagined it to be from like the Will Smith song and you know, <laughs> uh, but a lot of good people watching there. Yeah, so I, you know, for people listening, I went to Micah for a very brief brief time back in um, 2004. I had a uh, I had my flip phone and uh, and I got my lip pierced straight straight away. 
first <laughs> one of the first things it's like i mean art school gotta have my lip pierced my dad was really not happy with that phone call uh, <laughs> but, uh it was a great school and it was a really loved it a lot i had i came back to detroit for for personal reasons um uh, but I, I miss it for sure. It is, it is a really challenging art school. I mean, I, I remember, um, you know, when, like in high school, I was always like, I was always, you know, I studied painting and, and, and stuff in art school, but in high school, I was, I was kind of like the, the big fish in a little pond kind of thing when I, and there weren't that many people doing, you know, painting and stuff like that in high school. So it wasn't a big deal. And then, we were getting to Micah. That was my first art school experience. And oh my gosh, that was like a brick wall. Like, uh, I had like professors were like, Listen, you got to do a little better here. <laughs> Challenge you. <laughs> I remember I called my mom. I called my mom once. I'm like, I'm not any good anymore. <laughs> and then, but it was actually like, I really appreciated that because it's, um, I remember, like, from that day, like, his professor just had this, like, heart to heart with me. It was like, you got, you got to put in some more effort here. Um, and uh, it just really catapulted me into, like, a new, I came in, like, a new level of art making, I think, where I was kind of, kind of like, okay, this is, like, this is real, this is real life here. <laughs> Uh, and it's, you know, it's one of those things, I'm, I'm glad that you were able to experience uh, a taste of it. And it's, it's one of the, I, I did not come from an art background. I came from a business background. Um, I do not know how to paint. <laughs> um, but obviously, art is more than just painting. But it's, it's one of the things that I, I realized is that there is a perception that many people think art school is just like, oh, you can just, just do this thing. But it's, it's, rigorous it is um it's a very rigorous curriculum and it's beyond just creating this piece of art it's the problem solving it's the how do you take this idea in your head and put it into a a, a tangible thing that you have to explain um the meaning behind it and it's it's a it's a rigorous process to really just nail down those techniques but I think yeah. the beauty of it is that you're able to problem solve while you're creating at the same time. And I'm glad that there are faculty members that really just push, um, push, push you and push students to, to really um, dig deep into, um, you know, striving toward that, that, that progress of, of yeah. art making. Yeah. The, uh, that professor that, that took me aside, I actually, <laughs> I, 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 I partially owe like my everyday outfit of plain t-shirts to him. I can't even remember his name. <laughs> I remember, like, one of the first things he said, like, the first day of class was, like, if I'm wearing a shirt with a logo on it, that company better be paying me to wear that. <laughs> so I got a little business, a little business lesson there. Uh, there you go. <laughs> but, um, so what, what do you think is, um, you know, in your position, what, what do you think is unique about marketing in art school versus yeah. another industry, you know, CrossFit, whatever else that you've done? Yeah, um, what's what's unique working in art school and higher education, um, but specific to art school is because I come from a business background, you know, there's um, research, there's strategy, there's how is this making an impact on the profit and loss statement of the organization. And um, one of the unique aspects of my role um, in, an, in the art school is, is being able to leverage that business background of saying like, you know, we we have to produce a product, we have to market a product, and we have to make sure that it makes sense for students and for families to understand what is the return on investment if you're going to consume this product, um, but also being able to develop programming and develop curriculum that is data-driven and research-driven um, that supports you know, the trajectory of the student and it supports the, the industry, right? And it supports the career outcomes that a student um, can, can pursue. And so I really do think the, the aspect of marketing and art um, at MICA in particular, it, it's, it's fairly new, honestly. Um, there, there's been, uh, I think, one or two other director of marketing people in the past um, prior from, from me getting here. But um, the the concept of marketing is new, um, I think, for a lot of people at the college. And 
I, I think it's a really great opportunity now to be in this space to really educate my colleagues and educate um, you know, my, my community on the importance of marketing and the importance of doing research and the importance of having data and working with other agencies and partners to help inform which project or which programs um, can be sustainable or what areas that we need to look into that are new, that are emerging, that we need to bring into the, um, into the college mm -hmm. in order to support the needs of this next generation and how they're consuming education, how they're consuming art and design. So, um, so yeah, marketing in this space and, and art is, is super unique and I am excited for the opportunities that, that, um, that are coming and the ability to be able to provide new programming and, and new opportunities for a newer audience to consume art and design um, at MICA. Yeah, how, how are you going about research and collecting data? Is there specific um, avenues you guys go for, for the, through for that? Yeah, so I mean, traditional like focus groups, right? We're really um, talking to students, talking to prospective students, talking to families, seeing what they need. But then under, uh, we work with other um, partners uh, that help us um, do, uh, help us with researching on what are the emerging markets? What are the emerging careers? Um, what are the careers that we don't even know are going to exist in 10, you know, 15 years? And how are we um, providing uh, an opportunity for students to be able to um, consume education in a way that supports new, um, new, new careers in the future? So, so yeah, we, we do a mix of, you know, surveys, focus groups, interviews, um, and then working with other uh, third party um, partners to really um, understand what's out in the market and um, being able to use different technologies that support, you know, the return on investment and what are the salaries that people are getting out of um, different uh, program areas and how are we developing content and curriculum that supports that. Yeah. How would you say that MICA differentiates itself from other schools? Yeah, great question. Um, so I will say from hearing from students, from hearing from um, faculty and, and, and people that, that interact with the college, is MICA is situated in Baltimore City. And um, Baltimore in and of itself is such a creative, artistic community. And um, creative artistic community, but it's also a strong supportive community. And I believe that MICA differentiates itself in the sense that we really focus on the student experience. We focus on making sure that the student has everything that they need to succeed and that we provide the supportive environment. Um, there are other institutions that are perceived and um, are known to be a little bit more competitive in the sense of like, you know, it's me against you in the art space, whereas MICA, we differentiate ourselves where we work together, the students really learn from each other in various disciplines. So the student that is taking, you know, that is pursuing animation can connect with a student that's pursuing painting and learn from each other. And it's um, a collaborative uh, environment that I'm hearing and that I'm seeing from students that, um, that, attend, that attend the school. And I think the other differentiator with MICA too is that uh, there is one academic area in particular in the open studies area where we've been producing and um, offering online degrees um, for over 10 years at this point in mm -hmm. art and design. And we have you know, the business of art and design, um, a master's program in the business of art and design. And we have in the residential side too, um, we have, uh, a creative entrepreneurship center and we have a business curriculum that is embedded into um, the residential side that I think is also different in other art and design schools is where we're really teaching students the business aspect of um, of art and design and providing you know another angle to um, to show students you know how they could if they if they wanted to pursue their own business and um, in whatever uh, field that they're able to do so. So again, differentiators, I would say supportive community, uh, super collaborative, and also we do have this unique um, aspect of entrepreneurship and business curriculum embedded into the 
into the um, academic areas, which I think is, is unique to Chimica. That's great. I mean, the, um, I mean, I don't have too much experience with a, a lot of art schools, but I know when I was going in, when I was in art school 2004 through 2007, um, that the business side was just not something that was taught. Um, at, at least uh, the school that I ended up you know, spending the rest of my uh, college career and they had some classes which were which were helpful um but even like online you know youtube wasn't really a thing yet and there wasn't as much like self-learning that could be done um i relied a lot on like mentors that like that were in our community that were teaching me how to how to do that but it's so nice to see um like an actual focus on business because i think that 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 was something, and I've heard that from peers at other art schools that 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 was um, you know missing for them in their art school experience was like they left knowing how to make great art, but with like zero business sense. And I almost think like the business sense is almost as important, if not maybe even a little more important. <laughs> you know. Yeah, and and you know being able to provide that. Um access, I, I think, is a huge differentiator. And, you know, we, we have, like I mentioned, the, the Center for Creative Entrepreneurship, um, which provides a ton of resources for students who, you know, maybe they don't want to start their own business, but at least they can have a taste into what it could be like, or at least the insights into that. Um, and then the other part, too, that I, I, I want to touch upon that I believe is, is unique to Micah's with our first year students, there is an opportunity to participate in first year fellows program, um, which essentially you're just part of this amazing cohort <laughs> where you're you're in studios, you're learning, learning from different artists um, in the field and, um, and you have the ability to kind of like pick and choose your, your path at MICA. Um, so there's a lot of different options that students can participate in based off of their interests and it's yeah, it's pretty much like choose your own path, which I think is um, which is great for students to kind of get a taste of things that they might be interested in, how that can be integrated into their education. Yeah, and what I like about what you said about how you, how you differentiate yourselves is is the the idea that you you're pulling that information from uh, students um, and what they're saying about the school, and I think that's um, that's great. And I think. You know the pattern that 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 um, you know we see a lot of in higher ed is is what do we want to be true about our school, uh, not necessarily what students actually perceive to be true about the school. And so they're marketing more of like a they're they're they're, they're inventing differentiators that maybe not that aren't aligning with what students would would say is the differentiators for them. It's a balance of the two, right? Um, you want to be able to listen to students and listen to what their frustrations are, their challenges are, their ideas are, but also be able to back that up in a business sense. Like, does this make sense for the college? Does this make sense for how we want to be positioned? Um, but yeah, I definitely do believe that it's it's really critical to pay attention to what the students are feeling and thinking and saying in order to inform, again, how you want to be positioned into the market. Yeah. How much does storytelling uh, play a role in, in marketing at Micah? Yeah. Um, so storytelling plays a huge role. And, and to be honest, we are, we are, we are still crafting what that message is. Um, Micah is going through a couple different transitions as this podcast is being recorded right now. Um, a couple months ago, we uh, announced there's a um, academic restructuring that's happening. So that's um, being finalized right now. And uh, we are honestly, yeah, trying to craft what that, um, what that positioning statement is, what that, what that, not positioning statement, but what, what that uh, critical message is. Mm -hmm. And we see and hear and, um, published a ton of stories across what students are accomplishing, what alumni are accomplishing. And, um, and that's, it plays a huge role in how prospective students um, and families uh, see, see the college. And so we do uh, one of the, the initiatives that our, my team um, started is a, a, uh, not another newsletter newsletter. <laughs> and essentially um, every month or so, we have a theme that um, that we curate content and stories um, based on that theme. 
And it's been so impactful to share with our community and to share with um, you trustees and families and prospects and just the amazing art that is not only being produced, but how that's impacting communities and how that's changing people's lives um, through through the work that students have experienced at MICA. So storytelling plays a huge role in you know, what art and design can do for communities, what art and design can do for families and, um, and the world. And it's really beautiful to see some of these stories um, come out. And, and as a result, it's, it's you know, it, it helps with academic curriculum. So, you know, we have different types of partners that are able to provide funding to our academic areas for co-curricular opportunities for students to participate in. Um, we can leverage these stories to engage in other types of community partnerships, which I think is critical to um, creating trust and you just a general understanding and sharing of resources for art and design in this area. So well, storytelling is huge. <laughs> it's huge here. Is that mostly text-based uh, storytelling that you guys are doing? Uh, like articles or are you doing videos or how, how, what, what format does that come out in? Yeah, it's it's definitely more t more text-based heavy. Um, we are looking at um, other avenues uh, for video storytelling. Um, and, you know, we, 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 we do see the need for, for, vid for video storytelling and also just user-generated content. That's some of the things that um, some some of my colleagues on my team are, are working towards is you know how are we telling stories through social channels, um, but for right now it's predominantly text based. Yeah, user generated content. I mean, if you can get students to participate in that, I feel like sometimes it's it's it can be hard. I mean, in my you know uh, video career, trying to trying to get um, people to submit user generated content has been a challenge. But if you can crack that code. Uh -huh. um, you know, it's, I think that's some of the most powerful stuff. Definitely, definitely. <laughs> Quick break here to tell you about how you can scale up your student and alumni success stories without taking on a bunch of extra work uh, to manage with our video storytelling subscriptions. Look, making even one video, it takes a lot of legwork, lots of steps to go through, hire a video vendor, herd all the cats, do all the scheduling, and then you get one video out of that. But what if you could get a whole year's worth of storytelling content that you can use uh, to highlight your various programs and all you had to do was find the stories uh, and hand them off? Well, uh, you can hand them off to us, Unveiled. Uh, our aim is to take the friction out of telling great stories. So whether you're a big school uh, like Penn State or a smaller liberal arts college, you can tell really compelling stories all year round and fill your content calendar with video content. Uh, we get this done for you anywhere in the US. We're gonna batch shoot a year's worth of content and then every month drip out to you one new student or alumni story along with a whole package of additional video content. So you're gonna get the full length story, which is usually two to three minutes. You'll get a 30 second cut down, a 15 second cut down of that story to use in various ways and then eight topical videos to help you promote other things like scholarships, career development, internships, all that stuff. And not only can you take what we deliver and obviously crop it to how you need it, uh, format it however you need to for social media, do whatever you want, uh, but you're also gonna get all the B-roll and interview footage, all the raw stuff that we shoot. Um, and there's a wealth of additional content opportunities within that that you can run with, use it however you want, and you don't have to go film anything else. So head over to pricing.unveiled.tv to download our pricing guide, which has everything in it that you need to know. And if you'd like to chat further, you can book a call with me on our website, find me on LinkedIn, or uh, email me at john at unveiled.tv, and I'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right, back to my conversation with Bill Zimmerman. Um, so how, how does, um, how does, and, and just content creation, like how does Micah think about content creation? Where are you guys active? Like what social channels? Tell me about just the content creation strategy. Yeah, um, so we we utilize, um, you know, TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, um, LinkedIn, the, you know, the major, the major social channels um, to, to publish our content and um we do have youtube channel and the the areas that were the that my team is working on and and one of the things that i'm leading is being able to provide content that is specific to these channels but it also providing content that makes sense based off of where people are in their journey whether they're 
looking at MICA to attend as an undergrad student, a grad student, or their faculty, or they're looking for a career at MICA, but really being able to create content that makes sense at, and, pr and publish that content in a way that makes sense based off of where people are in their journey. Um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the way that we are taking in content is through word of mouth, right? We have faculty members, we have staff members saying like, so and so just did this, you know, they just won this award, or they're going to be exhibiting at this, you know, big uh, exhibition coming up. And so a lot of that is filtered through um, the central comms department, and we um, strategize on where this this content needs to live, whether it's the website or across switch channels. Um, so yeah, a lot of that is is sent through through word of mouth. Um, and then we use you know other social listening tools to really understand like how other um, publications and how other media outlets are sharing stories and how we're filtering that in to um, publish across our, our own media as well. Cool, I love it. Um, so tell me, so you have your own separate company as well. Uh, yeah, <laughs> Buffer and Muse, yeah. So um, I started, uh, launched Buffer and Muse uh, in 2022 um, just as a as a weight, as I, you know, throughout my career, been in marketing and business for over 15 years, and one of the things that I recognize is that, you know, marketing to, means so many different things to so many different people, and there's always a sense of um, how do I do marketing, right? There's there's this 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 common theme that um, I was coming across and hearing was just like the executional side of marketing. And so Buffer Muse really started as a um, as a project to have people understand what are the frameworks, what are the basic templates that you need just to, if you're a one person team or a small team, um, what are the frameworks that you need just to help you build the foundation of how to do marketing, <laughs> whether that's social media, whether that's email marketing, whether that's research, so I started this uh, this business um, to really provide people with the frameworks and the tools to help them execute on the initiatives that um, the organizations are. So it's a it's a new business. Um, you know, it's like I I have my full time job at, at MICA, but Buffer and Muse is um, you know something on on the side that uh, I I do um, that you know yeah. fills me up. <laughs> is there any meaning to the name? Buffering Muse? Uh, Buffering Muse, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so for me, I, I I tend to be behind the scenes in marketing. I, I tend to just be the, um, like, I like to orchestrate behind the scenes. And I see buffer, like the meaning buffer in like the music sense, it's like kind of like that in-between space. Hmm. And um and then muse, you know, muse is musing. So like, what is your your muse that gives you inspiration, that sparks that idea for you? So uh, it literally was a shower thought and it was like, well, for a muse. <laughs> um, but it, yeah, it's a mix of like, what is the in-between, the stuff that you can't really touch, you can't really, yeah, you can't, you can't, there's, it's not a tangible thing, but it's the yeah. in-between that still is profound that you know you have to do the research you have to understand how people feel in order to produce the thing um so that's that's how that name came up <laughs> cool i love it um and then you uh start i'm always fascinated with people that start podcasts um so you, <laughs> uh, especially as a way to market um you know business it, so your podcast is something relatively new right Yes, my podcast is new. Uh, started that in January of 23 of this year, and it's called Musings on Marketing. And it was also an idea that I've had for a couple years where I was like, I should just do a blog. And I had a, a small blog called Musings on Marketing. And, um, you know, with with writing, I, I used to write and publish a lot. I used to do freelance writing and everything, and I still do want to get back into it. But I found myself getting in my own way, where <laughs> it's like, I'm going to write this thing, I'm going to write this thing, and then I just never did it. And I do enjoy um, talking, voicing my my thoughts, and I find that to be a little bit easier. So I started 
using this in, as um, marketing um, as a podcast to reconnect with other marketers, right? Like I, I had just switched roles, you know, working with one academic area to now central comms. And I found myself like, you know, post COVID ish in the space of like, man, I haven't connected with other marketers in a long time. And I wanted to just be able to provide a, a way to reconnect with other marketers, to hear how they're going about their, their role in their day to day and seeing what emerging trends that they're seeing, if it's resonating with me, if it's, or, you know, if I'm going through a similar experience. And so, yeah, Musings and Marketing is my podcast. And it's, it's been fun to, to learn how to, how to, how to produce a podcast, edit, you know, I'm a one person show here. So it's, it's been cool just to do some research and um, see what tools and software <laughs> works best for, for a podcast. So. What, uh, what have you learned that you can share? I mean, I think we have like, <laughs> I thought you have like five or six episodes, which is, yeah, uh, which is a great start. I mean, I think I feel like people get like two, three episodes. I, I heard a statistic that's like something like 80%. And I'm probably just made, it's like, this is don't, don't quote this in the, in the fact books here, but eight, like 80% of podcasts never make it past the third episode. Oh, that's good to know. I'm on the other side of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the things that I've learned is that just keep working at it. Like, you know, whenever I am personally, when I do something for the first time, I get so overwhelmed. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to do this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. And literally with podcasting, it's just like just doing it. <laughs> it's just trying it out and continuously doing it. And so when I first started my podcast, I'll be completely transparent. I didn't have a microphone. So the first two episodes, the sound, I listened to it. I'm just like, it's like nails across the chalkboard for me. Um, so it's like, okay, let me just invest in a, in a microphone. And that just literally transform the way that it sounded obviously it sounded it sounds way much um way better but the um the thing that i learned is to document how to do it how to how to you know document what you need the podcast description the intro um i do use a software to help um to help combine like the the jingle the, the music at the beginning and the music at the end and the first couple episodes, I just like, I literally just like figured it out and I didn't write it. And then by the third or fourth one, I was like, wait, I should have wrote down what I actually did. So I don't have to like spend two hours to do it. So document how you do your process, <laughs> um, whatever that is for you. What's like, the software that you use? What's like? Um... Yeah, I use Alt Alitu, A-L-I-T-U. It's a, it's a software company based somewhere in Europe. <laughs> Um, and I know that because I get an international transaction fee, <laughs> which is like a dollar, but it's fine. Um, and, uh, I, yeah, I use that software. I use, um, headliner just for the social media uh, posts that I do. And my podcast is strictly audio right now. So I don't, I don't do the, the video and that was intentional because again, I'm a one person show and I was like, let me just start with the basics and um, just get this out there and then I can, you know, improve or, you know, iterate from there. I support that. I started as an audio only thing and, um, uh, it was way simpler than <laughs> put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> Although I, now I know there's, yeah, you're using Riverside. Yeah. There's a ton of, um, great tools now to help edit video and stuff, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's getting easier. Riverside has some good um, editing, like internal editing functions. And if you run your conversation with as little editing necessary as possible, which is what I'm kind of working towards, like I've, like if you listen to my first, I think it's like episode seven, if you listen to that first episode with like my, my first guest where I, I was um, interviewing someone, like the amount of ums I had to cut out of that was monumental and, and <laughs> like you know i would i would shave like two hours off of my editing time if i would just stop uh saying um yeah. all the time and stop like pausing in my sentences <laughs> yes yeah that's definitely something that i've learned too is just being intentional with what you're saying to help with the post-production process <laughs> yeah for sure well, and we talk, and I like to talk about the podcast because I know a lot of schools uh, are kind of just starting to dip their toes into a podcast and um, wondering if that's something worthwhile and what that will take. And, I, and you know, I, I resonate with, with what you said. It's just like, just do it. 
just do an audio only version, you know, re record your own thoughts on your iPhone or something like that and, and uh, upload it to LibSync or wherever, uh, you know, record a Zoom call. You know, that's the simplest way to have a guest is just just have a Zoom call or a Teams call and record it. There's um, there's downsides to that, which, you know, which is why I got River, Riverside to do these because it like records natively on each side. Um, so that if there's a disruption in the Wi-Fi, it doesn't, you're not getting that interference. You're, you're working with like the raw files from your side and my side. Um, that's an so that's, that's, uh, that's just one, one little hurdle that I had to get over. But yeah, I think it is starting a podcast is super overwhelming and I was really ag against it because I worked for a company for over a decade that was like really big into podcast. My boss then was really into podcasting, really good at it, really social, like extrovert, Enneagram seven to the max. And, uh, <laughs> and I am not, <laughs> so I was like, I, you know, my life is going to become like trying to find guests and <laughs> to out how to talk to people. <laughs> so yeah. yeah. It's a, it's an acquired skill, but I, I will say it, it, as, as I've done, I think this is probably my 20, third or 24th episode it's gotten so much easier and i you know my encouragement to anyone wanting to start a podcast is it gets easier you'll figure it out it's a little overwhelming at first but don't overcomplicate it <laughs> yeah sound advice i would agree with that um yeah i was, I was asking are you an enneagram three four four okay <laughs> I'm a three, but yeah, I, I hear you. It's a different experience. I'm, I would consider myself an ambivert, but yeah, there's definitely some, some, uh, pros that come out of if you're a natural extrovert, that it's probably a little bit easier for you. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can turn it on. Like if I'm in a conversation like this, where like, there's a purpose to the conversation, like a goal to the conversation. And when that goal is met, the conversation's over. Like that is my sweet spot. Like I can, I can be like lively and upbeat and I feel confident, but if I'm at like party, it's like the worst, like I avoid kids birthday parties or my two daughters that are in that peak birthday party uh, stage of life. <laughs> I will negotiate with my wife to the high heavens. I will, I'll clean the house. I'll, <laughs> I'll do the dishes. I'll scrub the toilets. What do I have to do? to trade for you to go to this birthday party and because I hate like, I hate, I hate open-ended conversations where you're just kind of talking to somebody like in passing and it's yeah, just the uh, small talk. I hate different. small talk so much. <laughs> I hate it so much. Well, Hey, this has been super great talking to you. Um, I really appreciate uh, you coming on the show and uh, kind of just being transparent with us about your, your process where, where can people um you know find you that want to connect with you or want to connect with uh, micah or buffer and muse or whatever else yeah thanks again for having me john this has been a real pleasure to, to speak with you um so for those of you who are interested in learning more about micah you can follow us on all the socials um or hit up our website mica mica.edu and I will um, also plug in, uh, you can find me, Sabrina DePest on LinkedIn and Buffer and Muse also on LinkedIn and Instagram as well. And yeah, Musings on Marketing, my podcast on, on all the platforms. So yeah, this has been a real pleasure, John. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you for listening. Three things I wanna give you before you go. Uh, reminder to go to, number one, reminder to go to pricing.unveiled.tv to download our free pricing guide and learn all about how our video storytelling subscriptions can make your marketing team's lives so much easier. Uh, number two, if you, uh, if you, if you're already doing storytelling or you want to do more of it, you want to do it better or differently. Uh, I have a three part, uh, storytelling framework that you can download at unveiled.tv slash student testimonials. Um, and that will take you through uh, the framework that we put to use in the videos that we create. Um, and it doesn't even have to be for video, it can be for written uh, context, uh, written text based uh, content as well. Uh, number three, leave a review for this podcast. Uh, I'd really appreciate it. It helps us out a ton. Uh, thank you so much for listening. My name is John Azoni. Uh, go connect with me on LinkedIn. Email me at john at unveiled.tv. Uh, that's J-O-H-N. Um, and in the meantime, we'll catch you in the next episode of the Higher Ed Storytelling University podcast. Thanks. Mm -hmm.